Hello, and thank you all so much for, for joining today's webinar, which is sponsored by Agios Pharmaceuticals. My name is Alex Dubois, and I will be facilitating today's program. Today, we will be talking about living with PK deficiency and more specifically, iron overload in PK deficiency. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to introduce some of the features of this platform. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Zoom after the last year and a half, but just wanted to remind you of a few things. First, if you move your mouse to the top center of the screen near the green bar, click on the view options menu. Make sure you have selected fit to window in side-by-side -side mode. You should see the presentation on the left and me or the speaker on the right. Next, on the top right of your screen, please make sure you're in speaker view to best see the presenter. If you have questions for the speakers throughout uh, during today's meeting, we encourage you to submit those by using the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you go to the chat, um, you will type your question and submit it to Jacqueline-Q&A. Click send and your question will be shared with the presenters. To make sure everyone is familiar with this feature, let's try it out. Please type into the chat box the state in which you are dialing in from. And if you need any assistance during the presentation, please contact our tech support via the chat function or by calling 781-908-4788. But if you are disconnected for any reason from the webinar, you can re-enter the program by using that same meeting URL you used to join earlier. It was provided to you in a reminder email about today's program. All right, great, thank you. It looks like we've got folks from Missouri, Texas, Massachusetts, across the country, fantastic. So again, if at any time during the program you have questions, please submit these through the Q&A box and we will be addressing them both during and after the presentation. We expect today's webinar to be about 90 minutes. The first part of the presentation will feature a healthcare specialist speaking on iron overload in PK. Uh, According to the Springfield News Leader, we made a followed, <laughs> Thank you. Followed by an individual living with PK deficiency sharing her personal story. And then a question and answer session. But like I said before, please ask questions throughout. Following these presentations, we will then have a member of the Agios Patient Services team share an update on the recently launched My Agios Patient Services program. The speakers and the Q&A portion of the webinar will be recorded. The last part of this program will be reserved for our attendee breakout rooms. We will divide the group into breakout rooms where you will be able to unmute yourselves, um, come off on camera and connect with one another. Please know that these breakout sessions will not be recorded, but more instruction to come when we get to that portion of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, first, we will hear from Dr. Sheth, Chief of, the, Chief of the Division of Pediatrics, Hematology, Oncology, and Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at Will Cornell Medicine in New York, and Jill who is from Minnesota and will share, share her personal experience of living with the condition. Thank you. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to re remind you all that as I mentioned at the beginning, the program is sponsored by Agios and Dr. Sheth is presenting on behalf of the company. The information shared in the program is not intended as medical advice and know for any medical or treatment related questions you do need to talk to your own personal health care team. Dr. Sheth is being paid to participate in this webinar, and this webinar is for U.S. audiences only. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sheth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, and welcome to everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, or good evening um, to all. Um, what we're going to talk about today is we're gonna learn a little bit more about how pyruvate kinase deficiency causes anemia, just very briefly. Then we'll talk about the causes of iron overload in patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency. We'll discuss the potential complications of iron overload, the recommendations for monitoring your iron levels over time. And then we'll talk a little bit about the management options for iron overload itself. So what is the role of red cells in the body? So I'm sure you all know that red cells in the body are responsible for carrying oxygen from the lungs to the tissues 
and then carrying carbon dioxide back from the tissues to the lungs for the carbon dioxide to be excreted out when you exhale. It is very important to keep in mind that these red cells, you need to have a certain number of red cells, they need to have a certain oxygen carrying capacity, and they work only when they're able to function on their own effectively. So pyruvate kinase is a very key enzyme in the energy metabolism of the red blood cell. So it's important to keep in mind that red cells can only use glucose to make energy. Other cells can use things like fatty acids and, and amino acids or so proteins and fats to, to generate energy, but red cells can only use glucose. Pyruvate kinase is an enzyme that helps to convert this glucose into energy. And the energy is in the form of ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is just the, the, the technical name for these energy uh, containing uh, molecules. Healthy red blood cells have enough pyruvate kinase to continue to allow them to make energy in this way by breaking down glucose throughout the lifespan of the red blood cell, which in, in individuals who, are, who don't have any pyruvate kinase deficiency is somewhere between 100 and 120 days. Red cells that don't have enough pyruvate kinase, so if you have pyruvate kinase deficiency, these cells can't make energy effectively or efficiently. And as a result of the lack of energy, they may break down. And this breakdown is called hemolysis. When red blood cells don't have enough pyruvate kinase, they do undergo hemolysis and their lifespan is shortened. As a result of the shortened lifespan, the bone marrow tries to compensate by making more red blood cells, but all of these red blood cells have the same problem. They don't have enough pyruvate kinase and therefore they don't live as long as normal red blood cells do. And this results in anemia. So the breakdown of red blood cells leads to fewer red cells in the circulation and that results in the anemia. The symptoms of anemia include fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive difficulties or brain fog, you know, when you have more severe anemia. And then as a result of the hemolysis, you have the production of bilirubin, which is a breakdown product from the red blood cell. And that bilirubin is what causes your eyes to look yellow and your urine to become dark yellow as well. So that might occur in individuals with severe deficiency who have a high rate of hemolysis as well. Now switching gears to talk about iron overload. So when iron accumulates in the body, it results in iron overload. Unfortunately, the body doesn't really have a way of excreting excess amounts of iron. So once the iron goes in there, it needs help to come out. This is unlike something like sodium, for instance, you know, which, is, which is found in, in common salt. So if you decided I'm gonna eat two bags of potato chips, which have a lot of salt in them, your sodium level should go up, but your kidneys, if they're working effectively, will excrete that excess sodium. And so sodium does not accumulate in your body. Unfortunately, the body doesn't have any way of doing that with iron. And so when iron goes in, it stays in, unless you help it to be excreted. Iron accumulation pyruvate kinase deficiency can occur as a result either of blood transfusions, which are used to correct the anemia, or as a result of increased iron absorption from the intestine. Now we don't know this for a fact, but individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency have what we call ineffective erythropoiesis, which just means that they're not able to make red blood cells effectively, again, because the red cells have a deficiency in the enzyme and can't make energy or ATP normally. So we borrow from another disorder that has a similar issue with anemia, which is thalassemia, in which we know that, the, that there is ineffective erythropoiesis, and we know the effect of that ineffective erythropoiesis is to increase the absorption of iron from the intestine. So when you have anemia, your body kind of thinks it's iron deficient because the most common cause of anemia is iron deficiency. And so when you become anemic, your body thinks, oh, I don't have enough iron in my body. And so it increases the amount of iron you absorb. And that again, results in the iron overload in this particular situation. So just to, just, just to be clear, iron overload is a risk for all patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency, 
whether they receive transfusions or not. So those who receive transfusions will get it through the transfusions because again, the red blood cells contain iron. And once the red blood cells go in, even when they're broken down, that iron cannot be excreted. And then others who are not regularly transfused might get it because of the increased absorption from the intestinal tract. So here we are, red cell transfusions, um, which are used in some people with pyruvate kinase deficiency who have more severe anemia. These individuals, as well as others who may receive episodic transfusions, may, re may develop what we call transfusion-related iron overload. Now remember, the red cells contain hemoglobin. Hemoglobin contains iron. And therefore, every transfusion of red cells adds iron into the body. Each unit of packed red blood cells contains about 200 milligrams of iron. Now, if you think about this, an, a, a normal adult-sized person has about 4,000 milligrams of iron. And so one transfusion, one bag of blood adds about 5% of iron that you would normally have. It adds 5% to that. So if you do the math, when you get about 20 transfusions, now you have 20 units of blood, you've doubled the amount of iron in your body. That is not a good thing. And so this is, this is what happens in individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency who receive red blood cell transfusions. So just to, just to, to study that, um, they, the, uh, there was a, a study that was conducted where a large number of patients were collected into a registry, about 250 patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency. And Rachel Grace and her colleagues studied the natural history of the disease. Analysis of this data showed important findings, and I'm gonna focus on the ones related to iron overload. So iron overload was the most common complication in patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency. About half the patients who were studied in this registry had iron overload. Okay. Of the patients with iron overload, 38% were not receiving regular transfusions. And 18% had never had a transfusion. So of the 38%, some had gotten episodic transfusions, but 18%, about half of those patients, had received no transfusions at all, and they were still iron overloaded. So again, going to show that transfusions alone are not responsible for the iron overload, but you do develop it because of increased iron absorption from the gut as well. And therefore, it is important that given this risk, that all individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency should be closely monitored for the development of iron overload. And we'll see how that is done in a minute. It is important, therefore, to discuss iron overload with your, with your healthcare provider, understand the monitoring, how it's going to be done, how frequently it's going to be done, and then understand the treatment should the monitoring show that you are actually iron, deficient, uh, iron overloaded as well. So what are the pot potential complications from this iron overload? Iron deposits in the liver. Now, the liver is a normal storage site for iron, but it can only store so much. When you exceed that capacity, iron causes scarring. And this scarring can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. So cirrhosis, which most people understand, comes from being an alcoholic, right? Alcoholic cirrhosis is the most common cause of cirrhosis, but it's important to keep in mind that iron overload can also cause liver damage that can cause cirrhosis. And if you're a drinker, that makes it even worse. Heart issues. So iron can deposit in the heart. The heart is pretty, particularly sensitive to the deposition of iron. And this can lead to both things. An inability for the heart to pump normally, leading to heart failure, or an inab the inability of the, of the heart to beat at a regular rhythm, giving rise to an irregular heartbeat and what we call arrhythmias. Osteopenia or a decrease in bone mass or bone mineral density can also occur and is related to iron overload. But this is multifactorial, and there's a lot of hormonal comp uh, components to this, a lot of calcium and vitamin D components to this, as well as iron overload as well. And then iron overload can also result in problems in your endocrine organs, so your hormone-producing glands in your body. And this can lead to thyroid dysfunction, the development of diabetes, 
delayed puberty or sexual dysfunction as a result of a decrease in um, sex hormones, as well as growth retardation in children who don't make enough growth hormone as a result of the iron overload as well. So a lot of different complications. It can affect a lot of different organs in your body. And therefore, it is important to do the, the, the monitoring that I mentioned and then to treat it once you diagnose that iron overload does actually exist. So the importance of iron monitoring, as I, as I said, is because every patient with pyruvate kinase deficiency is at risk for developing iron overload. And iron overload, if, if it is allowed to develop, can lead to all of those complications. And we know, again, from literature in other diseases where iron overload develops, that this results in a significant reduction in life expectancy because of the development, particularly of heart disease, right? And so if you have heart failure or you have an irregular heartbeat, that can lead to complications that can cause significant morbidity and even mortality. So there are tests that are, um, that are, that are performed as follow-up assessments that can help you and your doctor identify the risk of iron overload early. It's important, again, to identify this early so that it can be treated early and that would prevent the iron from accumulating to a significant amount, and that can lead to a, an amelioration of complications. The type and frequency of tests will differ from patient to patient, and this is something that we'll talk about in a minute as well. Patients who, who receive regular transfusions and therefore regular chelation therapy, we'll talk about what chelation therapy means, will need more frequent monitoring, and those who don't receive regular transfusions will load iron less rapidly and therefore can be monitored less frequently as well. And therefore regular monitoring can help diagnose iron overload and start treatment in a timely manner, preventing complications from occurring. And what you see on the right-hand side of that, that slide is a, a quote from a patient who said, it's scary for parents, but at least they know what's going on. Parents can now anticipate what's going to be needed. They can anticipate iron overload and begin to treat that earlier on so that kids don't have organ problems. And this is really important because this is a very key thing to treat and prevent complications from occurring. So here's the recommended monitoring schedule for iron overload. And again, this needs to be tailored by your doctor based on what kind of therapies you're getting. So again, as I mentioned, if you're getting regular transfusions, you need to be monitored more frequently. And if you're not getting regular transfusions, you can be monitored less frequently. Now, doctors may do a simple blood test called the serum ferritin to measure the amount of iron in your, in your body. Um, and this is a simple blood test, but it's not the most reliable of blood tests because the, the ferritin level can change or can go up as a result of things like an infection. So if you had a cold or a sore throat, that can cause your ferritin level to go up as well. And that does not actually reflect iron overload. That just tells you that there is some inflammation going on. And therefore, rather than doing relying just on the ferritin level, it's recommended that we perform an MRI to measure the iron content of your liver and your heart. So MRI is able to measure iron in tissues directly. And this gives us a very good idea of the, a very reliable idea of the amount of iron overload you have and is able to guide therapy accordingly. So the schedule be below uh, in, this, in this little box here <coughs> was developed from, uh, from leading pyruvate kinase deficiency specialists and show the testing that's, that's um, uh, re recommended for it, adults with iron overload. Young children may not be able to stay still for MRI without sedation. And therefore, again, the, whether or not children should have an MRI depends on what their risk of iron overload is, depending on whether they get transfused or not. So if, you're, if, you, if your child is getting transfused regularly, then doing those MRIs is actually really important. And therefore, you must talk to your doctor about doing those as well. So in regularly transfused patients, those who get six or more transfusions a year, it's recommended that ferritin levels be checked every three months. 
and a, and a heart and a liver MRI be done annually. Now, if you are able to keep the iron in check with chelation therapy, then you might do the cardiac MRI less frequently, but initially at least you've got to start with doing it annually and follow the trends and then decide based on that. Individuals who are not regularly transfused should have a ferritin level checked at least once a year. More frequently, if you get you know, three, four, five transfusions, then it should be checked more frequently as well. And then the same thing applies to the, uh, the MRI. A baseline uh, scan of the liver and the heart should be done, I would say, in the second decade of life. Um, and then the scan should be, should be considered very um, seriously when the ferritin level is above 500 consistently, not just one level, but consistently over 500. And then the frequency of subsequent scans depends on the initial findings, as well as what's done in terms of how many more transfusions you're getting and, and, and what your ferritin level is doing as well. Now, there are several different ways in which we can treat iron overload in general. So if you do have iron overload, you will need treatment to remove that iron because otherwise you'll have the complications that I mentioned. <laughs> the excess iron can be removed by medications called iron chelators, which bind to the iron and facilitate its excretion. So since iron can't be excreted normally by the human body, it, it, the body needs help. And so these medications are able to bind to the iron, make that complex more excretable, and then it comes out. Generally, patients on regular transfusions are on continuous iron chelation therapy. Non-transfused or episodically transfused patients may be on intermittent chelation therapy based on the monitoring of ferritin and MRI. Now, phlebotomy is used sometimes to manage iron overload in other situations. So individuals who have iron overload as a result of say an inherited condition like hereditary hemochromatosis, those individuals could go and donate blood you know, every two or three months and that could keep their iron in check. Remember, the blood is where most of your iron is. And so if you go and donate blood, you can remove iron that way. Women who either menstruate or have a pregnancy, lose blood or lose iron to the baby. And that is another way in which blood can be, uh, iron can be, uh, can be lost. But if you're getting regularly transfused and you're not losing blood, then you need to have the iron removed another way. Now, there, there are no good studies looking at the effectiveness of phlebotomy or blood removal in patients with anemia. Now, Again, it's kind of counterintuitive. You have anemia, your hemoglobin is low, and then you're, you're having blood taken out, and that's going to drop your hemoglobin even further, right? It's going to put more stress on your bone marrow, and that's going to make your ineffective erythropoiesis even worse. Right? So, so for individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency, my personal opinion is that phlebotomy should never be a treatment that we consider. And if you are iron overloaded, it should be treated with iron chelation therapy. So chelation therapy is a way in which iron can be removed from the body. And there are several different options. There are two that may be given orally, two medications. One that's given either through a subcutaneous injection or infusion or through an IV infusion as well. And these are those drugs. So deferoxamine, which is the oldest chelator we've had since the 1960s, is usually given as an infusion under the skin subcutaneously or as an infusion into a vein over a prolonged period of time. It has to be given over a long period of time because it has a short half-life. It doesn't last in your body for very long and therefore it has to continuously be administered for it to work well. It is important to monitor the kidney and liver function, the complete blood counts, and the hearing and eye tests when you're on this medication. Generally, there are few side effects, but because it's given the way it is by subcutaneous or intravenous infusion, it is very cumbersome. And sticking to the, to the, to the treatment may be very challenging as a result. 
And we know that in the era before the oral agents were available, that patients were not very compliant with this and le this led to a lot of different complications. Now, luckily, we do have two oral chelators, the ferrous syrops, which is available either as a film coated tablet, a tablet to mix in water or sprinkles, which can be, which can be mixed in yogurt or applesauce and given to children. Again, the monitoring is listed there, liver and kidney function, um, urine, urine testing, complete blood counts. Um, this, is, this is much, much more convenient because it's an easy to swallow uh, pill. Um, the tablet that is mixed in water doesn't taste that great, but now we have a pill. So if you, if you can swallow a pill, you probably do pretty well on this um, chelator. And the other good thing is that it can be given just once a day and you don't have to bother with multiple times a day administration. By and large tolerated quite well. So that's the go-to first line therapy that we currently use because it's once a day and has a relatively good side effect profile. The ferriprone is another oral chelator which is available as tablets. Again, the monitoring is listed there. The important one here is to monitor your neutrophil count or your ANC or your white blood cell count because the drug can cause the white blood cell count to go down and that can lead to a predisposition for severe infections. So that has to be monitored very carefully. You also need to follow the liver function test as well. Um, this is usually given either two or three times a day and therefore not as convenient as the once a day the ferrous the, this is usually used as a second line therapy if you are either not tolerating the, the first one, the deferosyrox very well, or you need more intensive therapy that you can get, then you can get with just one agent. So you might need to add a second. Similarly, diferoxamine is also used only in patients who, the, the infusion one is only used in patients who either can't tolerate the oral because of side effects or as a, an additional agent if you want to do combined therapy for somebody who has very high iron levels and needs to get them down fast. Um, Dr. Sheth, I'm gonna interrupt here. We have a couple yes. of questions that have come in. Sure. Uh, the first, someone has asked, are we at greater risk for high output cardiac failure? Yes, you are, because high output cardiac failure results from severe chronic anemia. So if you're, if you're not regularly transfused, then yes, because of the anemia, you could it could lead to high output cardiac failure. Th that is different than low output cardiac failure where the muscle is not working at all because of the iron deposition. So the high out output cardiac failure does not result from iron. It results from the chronic anemia, whereas the low output failure results from the complication from iron deposition. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, are A1C readings known to be inaccurate for people with PK deficiency? So that's a very good question. And obviously, if you're getting regularly transfused, then yes, the A1C level is useless because you're measuring the A1C of the transfused blood, right? And keep in mind that, you know, the blood, when it's stored in the blood bank, is sitting in a glucose solution. And so it's binding to all of this glucose and causing the A1C to go up. And so it is not very reliable as an indicator in regularly transfused patients. In non-regularly transfused patients also, and we don't know this for sure, it may also not be a, reg a very reliable indicator because the red cell lifespan is so short, right? So you need the hemoglobin, you need the red blood cell to be in contact with high levels of glucose for your hemoglobin A1C level to go up, right? But if your red cell is not around for long enough, then your A1C level may not go up. And therefore, once again, you may have a falsely low level of hemoglobin A1C, and that might not reflect the true state of your body. When you're regularly transfused, you have a falsely high level of A1C. When you're not regularly transfused and you have significant hemolysis, then you may have a falsely low level of hemoglobin A1C. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. So other considerations to prevent or manage iron overload. Most people who have anemia get put on iron. 
Again, iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia worldwide. And so it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction. You're anemic, take iron, right? That's, that's what, that's, that's, you know, that's everybody knows that as a, as a, a sort of reflex thing. Well, not so in pyruvate kinase deficiency because you could actually be iron overloaded and taking iron, remember, you're absorbing more iron from the intestine because of the anemia. And in this situation, you may already be iron overload and you still are absorbing more iron from the intestine. So if you put more iron into the intestine, you will absorb more and this will worsen your iron overload. So iron supplements must be avoided in individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency unless you are documented to be iron deficient. So you need to have a blood test to confirm that you're iron deficient. Only then should you take an iron supplement. Follow a balanced diet. You can, a moderate intake of iron rich foods such as liver and red meat is okay. It, it, you know, we, the absorption is increased, but changing your diet is not significantly going to change that amount of iron that you absorb. So it's okay, a moderate. I'm not saying eat, you know, 12 ounces of steak every day, but you know, if you decide I'm gonna eat a little bit of steak, you know, twice a week or so, that's okay. You don't have to change your lifestyle completely and completely ban iron-rich foods. As I mentioned before, women with pyruvate deficiency who are pregnant and have iron overload should consult with their physicians about taking prenatal vitamins with iron. You can certainly take prenatal vitamins without iron, but with iron, you have to make sure that you consult with your doctor. If you're iron overloaded, no iron, because that will be used by the developing fetus. And chelation therapy should be stopped before pregnancy because of the potential risks to the baby. So it's not really been studied except for maybe the, the infusional uh, agent, which has been used in the third trimester only, but otherwise the other two are not, the oral agents are not to be taken during pregnancy at all. And then, so when should I see my hematologist? You should visit your hematologist at least annually more frequently depending on your specific situation, both for routine monitoring as well as for screening for a variety of different complications. You, may, you should see the hematologist if you want to do adjust your pyruvate kinase deficiency management plan. So if you want to adjust your chelation, if you want to adjust your activity levels, if you want to consider transfusions, et cetera. Or if you experience any of the following worsening pallor or fatigue, significant worsening of the jaundice, the yellowness of the eyes, which could indicate increased hemolysis and therefore a drop in your hemoglobin level. New onset, new onset abdominal pain, worsening or new shortness of breath, which might indicate either a lung infection or a heart failure. Fever, especially after a splenectomy. This is an urgent issue and you should be seen right away, whether it's by your doctor or an emergency department right away. Or any new symptoms that are unexpected that you don't feel like, oh, I don't know what is going on here. Call your doctor and speak with him or her. Great. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, okay. Could you please define um, moderate intake of iron containing foods? Um, the thought was some people think that they should follow the same diet as those with hemochromatosis. You can follow the same diet as patients with persons with hemochromatosis because yes, that is a, a um, relatively reduced amount of iron relatively again. But as I said, you know, anything in moderation is probably okay. So if you're eating a steak, eat, you know, instead of eating a 12 ounce steak, eat maybe an eight ounce steak. And, and instead of eating, you know, eating steak, say seven days a week, eat it maybe twice a week. Okay? And, and, you know, reduce your intake of things like like spinach and things like that a little bit as well. Don't eat, you know, don't eat green leafy vegetables every single day in large amounts. Uh, but the most, the, the highest iron content, uh, of highest iron containing foods are red meats. So limiting red meats as, 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 you know, again, to some degree is important. Otherwise you're, you're probably okay. It's, it's really important to keep in mind not to take iron containing supplements because that iron is, is, you have a lot more iron in there and it's much more easily absorbed from there than it is from food. So avoid the supplements completely. 
Um, but in terms of iron containing foods, you know, it, in moderation, we should be okay. Okay, thanks. The next question. My doctor says that my red blood cells are huge. Is that normal? Should I be concerned? No, that's actually normal. So the, the red blood cells that come out of your bone marrow are large, and then they kind of become a little bit smaller as they mature in, in the circulation. And this is, this is because your bone marrow in pyruvate kinase deficiency is putting out a lot of immature cells, right? Because the marrow is very hyperactive. It's working really, really hard because the lifespan of the red blood cells is low and there's anemia. And so you really, so this, these cells are coming out very prematurely. And so they're very large. They haven't had a chance to mature fully in the bone marrow. And so what happens is that they come out of the, of the, of the bone marrow and they're quite large. That is to be expected, and that's, it's, it's, it's not um, unusual at all in individuals with pyrotinus deficiency. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so to summarize, as we, we've learned today that pyruvate kinase deficiency causes red cells to break down prematurely. This is called hemolysis, which leads to anemia. Iron overload is an excess of iron in the body and is a risk for all patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency, regardless of whether they're getting transfused or not, regardless of their age, though the older you are, the more likely you are to, get, uh, to, become, to be iron overloaded and regardless of your hemoglobin level. Iron overload could be a result of increased red cell transfusions. It could also be in non-transfused patients as a result of increased amounts of iron absorbed from the intestine. Iron overload is associated with damage to different organs of the body and therefore regular monitoring, early detection are critical to the appropriate ma management. It's important to work with your hematologist to figure out what your schedule of monitoring should be, when you should have your ferritin checked, when you should have your MRIs. And the most common way of treating um, iron overload is by using iron chelation therapy. I think that's the last slide. And I'm going to say thank you and pass it over to Jill. Great, thank you. Actually, I'll take it back for just a minute. So okay. thanks so much, Dr. Sheth. Um, and keep those questions coming in. Um, Dr. Sheth is going to be staying on the line and after Jill shares her story, we're gonna open it up for a full Q&A. So thank you for those original questions and keep them coming in. Next, um, I would like to invite Jill to join us to share her story of living with PK deficiency. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you this evening telling my story. Again, my name is Jill. I'm 60 years old. Um, I live in Minnesota and I live with pyruvate kinase deficiency. I'm a mother of two boys um, who are in their 30s and a grandmother of four. My sons do carry the gene, but they're in the process of um, having their grandchildren tested. I'm also a twin. Um, however, we are fraternal. And my twin sister does not live with PK deficiency. Twins do run in our family. My mom's siblings are twins. And one of my sons just had twin girls about eight, nine weeks ago. So growing up being a twin really defined me, but not in the way that some might think. My twin sister, Joy, was healthy and active. Um, and then sitting next to her, I was very yellow and lethargic, and I was always sick. It was a stark comparison. Um, and this is actually how I, I was diagnosed. Um, when my sister and I were 18 months old, uh, we were playing in our playpen. And my grandfather saw us um, and Joy was pink and lively. And I was very yellow and um, almost lifeless. So my parents took me to the local hospital where the test began. And they immediately transfused me. Um, I was so little, they had to cut my ankles open to do the treatment. The doctors didn't know, of course, what was going on with me, but they began watching my hemoglobin. Uh, my treatment included weekly transfusions until I was five years old. By the time I was 10, um, I was passing out a lot. I was passing out in school at the Blackboard. I was passing out in church. <laughs> um, and I grew up in a town of less than 100 people. So understandably, there wasn't a lot of medical resources there. The local doctors didn't know what to do with me. Um, and they thought at that time that I had leukemia. They ended up sending me to a, a larger hospital in the Minneapolis area. 
which is about 90 miles away from our home. Um, I was one of five children and my parents ran a local business. So they basically dropped me off at the hospital for a week and all sorts of tests were done. And that's one, one including was um, for PK deficiency. Um, and that's where I was officially diagnosed with PKD. It was in 1971 and I was 10 years old. As you can imagine back in the seventies, there wasn't a lot of information about PK deficiency. And for my parents, hearing that the diagnosis was like a foreign language. They had no concept of what this was. Um, all they knew that it, it was hereditary and it was diagnosed on my dad's side of the family. And it was hem hemolytic anemia. Um, they talked about all that red, red blood cell stuff. And again, I was 10. I had no understanding of this. So strangely, the doctors didn't do anything with my diagnosis. I didn't have transfusions or start any type of medication. Um, but when I hit puberty at around 14 years old, I started having severe abdominal pain. Um, again, my parents took me to the local hospital, small town, and um, they said my spleen was enlarged. So they removed it. And then six months later, I had the same severe abdominal pain. Um, the hospital basically said, we don't know what this is. We don't know what to do. Um, so they, I, I went to a, a larger um, hospital and they diagnosed me with gallstones. So they removed the gallstones in my gallbladder and I was okay for a while after that. I lived normal high school years. I was active in band and I went through marching band and did all those fun things that high school offers. <laughs> and I didn't have any transfusions or any type of real treatment for PK deficiency. In fact, I didn't see a hematologist until I was 21 years old. So after college, I got married and I started my family young and I'm glad I did because I was unwise and unknowing of any complications that PK deficiency poses for pregnancy. So at 21, I was pregnant and that's when I saw a hematologist. And another strange thing that happened is I had a bicornuate uter uterus, meaning I had two uteruses. So I was considered high risk anyway with PK deficiency, but even more so with two uteruses. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't hemolyze during that pregnancy. My son was born and everything was fine. Now they say that every pregnancy is different and that was true for me. A year later, I got pregnant with my second son and my PKD symptoms really intensified. Um, I started hemolyzing. And I was passing out again. My hemoglobin went below three. So I was in strong danger zone there. Um, I had about six transfusions during the pregnancy and my second son was born, he was healthy, but obviously I wasn't. Um, the hematologist I was seeing at the time knew a PKD and he enlightened me. He told me that I was even lucky to have kids and and um, suggested for me not to have, to have any more children because he didn't think I'd survive another pregnancy. Um, he explained to me that PKD, um, that there were a lot of unknowns at the time, again, that was 40 years ago, that I needed to monitor myself and how I was feeling and basically gave me a running pass. So if I didn't feel well, just to go to my local doctor and get my hemoglobin tested. Um, and he really helped me during that period of time. I felt like I had somebody on my side and really knew what was going on. When I was in my 30s, I started experiencing the effects of iron overload, which was common for those who live with PK deficiency. When my doctor had my iron checked, um, I was hitting 1,000. I was in, um, up in the high numbers. And um, I haven't been doing anything for iron testing for years. So at the time, the doctor decided to do phlebotomies. I was in my mid forties and I um, was having phlebotomies every eight to 12 weeks. I did try creation therapy, but my body didn't tolerate, tolerate it. I was experiencing liver damage um, within four days of dosage. And so the doctors stopped. So, um, as of now, 
my doctors continued to monitor me and I continued to check my hemoglobin, but I really never felt like I found a treatment plan that works for me. For years, my health has been a little bit of a roller coaster. I've had other health conditions develop, hormone issues, and low estrogen levels. Plus, I was diagnosed with full osteoporosis fairly young, um, which I didn't know at the time was related to pyruvate kinase deficiency. And I didn't know that iron overload was either at the time. So today I'm still trying to wrap my arms around this. Um, I'm still searching for the right care team. Currently I see a general hematologist at a group practice. My current hematologist has continued with the phlebotomies for my iron overload, but it doesn't feel like the right approach for me. I'm you know, actively sink it, seeking um, other options. Um, it's not going that well. Throughout all these medical hardships, I've worked full-time. I worked when my boys were young and I'm still working full-time now. I started in retail and I went into business software sales. And I currently work full-time with a company um, that is really understanding of like PK deficiency, um, which has been really essential for me. Um, I worked remotely for over 13 years, um, which has been very important for me as well. So outside of work, I live with my partner. We have a dog. We like to take walks in the mornings and the afternoons and or in the evenings. I enjoy go to concerts and I love to, to dance if I have energy. <laughs> and I'm lucky because my sons and grandchildren live within a 30 mile radius of me. So we're able to get together as much as we can as also as much as my um, energy allows because we know that PK deficiency can be very unpredictable. And I never know if I would have energy to keep up with those, those little babies. <laughs> and at times it's really hard for me. Unfortunately, my sons are very understanding. Um, when I have free time, I do paper crafts, especially scrapbooking. Um, I captured my son's lives and a lot of hundreds of pages. <laughs> and currently I'm working on the books for my four grandchildren. I enjoy putting together pieces of memories like photographs and clippings and I put them in albums and it's just a really nice way to capture life's important moments. And it's also very Zen and meditative for me. Um, it's my, my kind of my quiet place. When I think about capturing the moments of my own life, of course, they include the birth of my sons and my grandchildren, but I've also more recent, a big one has me, for me has been learning about PK deficiency and finding the right resources and information. I really have to say, I really, I didn't know much about my, the impact of my disease until earlier this year. Um, I found knownpkdeficiency.com, social media, and um, agios, and um, everything just that I experienced started to make a lot more sense. The dots were getting connected. Um, when I came across all these resources, of course, I was giddy. <laughs> I shared it with my partners, my siblings, my sons, and you know, everybody was so happy for me that I have this resource and, um, you know, being at the age that I am never in a million years that I ever think that this would be possible, that there would be somebody out there that's doing research and studying and knows PK deficiency. Um, I attended patient webinars and I met others who are living with PKD now and I've learned about their struggles, but also their successes and it's been essential for me to have those connections. But when it comes to my PK deficiency, I've been flying solo for over 60 years with very limited information. And now I have supporting resources and I'm no longer feeling alone. And I say this repeatedly, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm not on the island of misfit toys and I'm not navigating rudderless anymore. I have these resources. Um, so with that information, um, I've been digging in with my hematologist and and more knowledgeable, and I'm feeling that my care um, is improving. I'm doing more um, uh, diagnostic things that I would have not done before. And, um, but there's so much more to learn. And, but I do feel like I'm no longer in the dark. I'm not alone in knowing um, enough about the PK deficiency, and I'm, that's why I'm here today. Um, that's why I participate in these events, to spread information awareness, in hopes of improving the quality of cares for those who are living with this disease. So I thank you for all you do and I really appreciate you listening. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Jill.
I know that story, I'm sure, resonated with so many listening today. So again, thank you. Um, now we're going to open it up for, for more questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, I'll just remind you that you can use the chat function and you can send those to Jacqueline Q&A um, and we will share those. Just remember that we cannot answer any questions about your own specific healthcare or specific treatments um, and that these questions should be directed to your own healthcare team. But with that said, um, I think we're, we're going to have Dr. Sheth back here too. There is a question for you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sheth, uh, you said that you must have a blood test to find out if you are iron deficient, but what specific test is needed? For example, if the test result by the pathologist says my daughter has hemolytic anemia and she is treated with iron, then how would we know if she is iron overloaded? Which test? Ferritin level? So, so if you have a hemolytic anemia, you don't, you don't usually become iron overloaded, I, I, sorry, iron deficient from having a hemolytic anemia, right? So what happens when you break down your red blood cells is you, you reutilize the iron that's in them. So they, it keeps recycling over and over again. You can become iron overloaded if you have a hemolytic anemia, but not all hemolytic anemias lead to iron overload. So pyruvate kinase deficiency we know does. And so to, I said you should be on iron supplements only if you're actually iron deficient. So if, you're, if, you, if your doctor feels that you're iron deficient, then the test to be, to be done is a serum iron and a TIBC level. That will tell you whether you're iron deficient or not. And if you're not iron deficient, you should not be on an iron supplement. Okay, and there's another one for you. Um, my MRI of my heart didn't show iron overload, but I had many bouts of atrial fibrillation. Fibril fibril you know what I'm saying, fibrillation, yep. fibrillation, yep. cardiac ablation, and eventually earned a pacemaker. My T2 score was close to indicating iron overload in my heart. Have you had patients with a similar history? Yes, unfortunately, yes. So, so the, the cardiac T2 star gives you a, an idea of what your iron level is in your heart at one point in time. It doesn't tell you what the history has been over time. And it's possible, I don't know the specifics, but it's possible that you may have had more iron in the heart that is now gone because of, of efficient chelation therapy. And, but, but the residual effect of the iron that was there before was to cause this problem with the atrial fibrillation because there's some amount of, of the cardiac tissue that was scarred by the iron. And that, you know, sometimes it turns to normal, sometimes it's not returned to normal. Or it could be unrelated. It's, you know, again, older individuals may develop atrial fibrillation just without any specific cause for it. So it's, it's you know, if, if, if you're an older individual and you developed atrial fibrillation later in life, that might be unrelated to the iron overload, unrelated to the hemolytic anemia. Okay. Um, a question for you, Jill. Um, do you have any specific advice, advice for younger people living with PK deficiency or even for their caregivers? Um, you know, that's a really good question because, as you know, I didn't have a lot of resources when I was younger. We didn't know what this was. Um, and all I know is just pay attention to your body and, um, and be your own healthcare advocate. It's, it's hard when, like you get the common cold, you get the flu, am I kicking into hemolysis? Am I gonna get over this? Um, you know, just recently I contracted RSV, which I thought was COVID and I know I was hemolyzing and I was. Um, they had to abort one of my phlebotomies cause I was hitting below eight on my uh, hemoglobin. All I can say is, um, be patient, listen to your body, um, listen, to, listen to your children about how they feel. And for an indicator for me personally, um, and it was when I was younger and even today, um, I just watch what the color of my, my eyes and my urine, if it's extraordinary, if it's more yellow than normal, um, it's an indication that something's going on. Um, and it's, it's all I can say is just watch, um, 
pay attention to how you're feeling. Um, I know for my own health care, I, I know that after COVID, I'll probably end up still wearing a mask into stores because getting colds and flus is just hard. It takes extra energy to get through those common illnesses. Um, and just um, try to you know, navigate through the healthcare system and find a hematologist that you connect with. This has been one of my biggest challenges um, is finding somebody that um, I know that understands this. Um, and because a, a, a few times with a couple of hematologists, I feel like I've been a guinea pig. They don't understand what's going on with me and understand the disease itself. So they're trying all these weird things and iron overloads jacking up and hemoglobin is going down, right? So um, just pay attention. And I think what um, Dr. Seth offered today, I'm still learning a lot. I took notes and um, keep a journal and keep records. Um, I wish I would have had this advice years ago because I would have paid attention more and would have been a little bit more on top of this. Um, but it just take notes and um, find a doctor that feels right and pay attention to your, to your, to what your body's saying and what your child, if you're a caregiver, is communicating to you. Um, I just didn't have that when I grew up. Thank you. Can I just say something to, to so Jill, first of all, thank you for, mm -hmm. for being so open and so descriptive and so clear about your story. It, 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 is, it is really inspiring to hear how you've dealt with this even in the absence of information. Yeah. And what, what I would add to what the advice you gave was to younger people to learn more about this. It, 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 the information is now at your fingertips. It is on your screen, on your phone, on whatever device you use. You don't have to go to a library to read. You don't have to talk to somebody. You can find out about this very easily. Again, caution, reliable sources, please. Don't, read, don't believe everything you read on the internet because it is not necessarily true. And the other thing I will say is I would encourage you to set up telehealth visits. Something that you couldn't do in the past, call and make an appointment for a telehealth visit with an, a specialist in a different state you know, that's, that, that is, is something that you can absolutely do. Give them a, you know, this is the overview of my condition. This is what is going on and get advice from a true specialist who has the experience. And again, this was not really feasible before COVID, but one of the things that has come about because of COVID is that now you can do these telehealth visits. You can actually set up an appointment and get on a on a Zoom call or get on one of these apps and, and, and talk to somebody face-to-face -face and get information and get advice. So I would encourage you to do that. All of the, everybody should do that. You know, if you don't have somebody who is a known expert in the field, find one and do a telehealth visit. That's great advice, thank you. Um, we have had a couple more questions come in for you, Dr. Sheth. Since PKD is a genetic disorder, is it known where in the human genome PKD is caused? Yes, there are, there are very specific locations on specific chromosomes where we know exactly where the gene is and we know exactly what the different types of mutations are in, in those genes. There are some mutations that are what we call missense mutations and there are some mutations that, that we call deletional mutations. And those are different because they, they they are um, one, the deletional mutations tend to be more severe than the missense mutations. Um, so yes, we do know that. We have a way of, of uh, analyzing the gene and telling you exactly what kind of defect you have and where it is in your, in your genetic uh, code, yes. Okay, great. Um, and another question, I've been prescribed folic acid since my original diagnosis in 1982. Why, what does this do? So one of the things that your body uses when you have hemolysis is this vitamin, which is called folic acid. Okay? And it, it is important that you, your body have enough folic acid because your bone marrow is already stressed. It's already stressed to the point of exhaustion sometimes, trying to keep up with the production of red blood cells because you have hemolysis and a destruction once they leave the bone marrow. So your body needs 
additional amounts of folic acid compared to somebody who does not have hemolysis. And that's the reason for the supplementation with folic acid. Now in pyruvate kinase deficiency, the hemolysis is, is actually oftentimes much higher, much more than in many other hemolytic anemias. And so individuals with pyruvate kinase deficiency should be on folic acid supplementation lifelong. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, I can't stress the importance of an, a, a regular balanced diet, which contains all of the different vitamins as well. You don't need other vitamin supplementation. You don't need iron supplementation for sure, but folic acid supplementation, you could absolutely benefit from. Okay, great. And another question, um, could you elaborate on the TIBC test? Um, the serum test would determine whether it's hemolytic anemia or PK deficient or just hemolytic anemia? And what is the now, number T range? T TIBC does not tell you that. TIBC is, stands for total iron binding capacity. And all the TIBC tells you is whether you're iron deficient or not. So an elevated TIBC tells you that you're iron deficient and a normal TIBC or a low TIBC tells you that you are not iron deficient. The TIBC does not tell you whether you have hemolysis or not. Okay, excellent. Those were some really great questions coming in. So thanks to everyone for those. Um, and if your question was not answered, if it was um, specific to your own treatment or um, to any therapies, please do ask your own healthcare um, providers for that. So with that, um, I'm gonna introduce, I'd like to uh, introduce Liz Herdick, patient support manager at Agios, who will share a brief update on the My Agios patient support program. Hand it over to Liz. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining tonight. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Herdick and I am one of the patient support managers with My Agios. I'm so excited to be here tonight to introduce you to My Agios, which is the recently launched disease education program for both patients and caregivers impacted by pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, and thank you so much, um, Dr. Sheth and Jill, for the great question and answer tonight. It was a re really good conversation. Um, and also thank you, Jill, for sharing your experience with My Agios. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, so My Agios is a complimentary patient support program that connects patients and caregivers living with PK deficiency to a dedicated patient support manager like myself with a clinical background. We take the time to get to know each patient um, and what your specific needs and interests are. Uh, we can then provide a tailored education to help you navigate each unique challenge so that you can feel empowered to manage your or your loved one's PK deficiency. We can go to the next slide. Our program is built on three pillars. Um, the first is tailored support. Our goal is to be really flexible to meet each patient's unique needs. We understand that everyone's journey with PK deficiency is different. Um, and it can really create different challenges as you go through different stages of your life. Um, but this flexibility includes how often we talk, the amount of time we can dedica dedicate to each call, um, the hours of availability, and the material and topics that we cover. Um, we will work with each patient over time um, in a way that best supports you to meet the challenges that you're experiencing to prepare for your future. Um, the second is educational resources. The nature of this program truly is educational, um, and we know that everyone is at a different place in their journey. So whether you're newly diagnosed or you've been living with PK deficiency for a, li a long time, um, we can provide tailored support and resources to help you better understand the disease and also to communicate effectively with your healthcare team. There's a wide um, range of resources that we have available. We have brochures, um, documents to help with communication with schools, um, a really great journal to help track symptoms in your labs. Uh, also different websites and patient support groups that we can help, help you connect with. Um, so the final pillar is community connections. Tonight's webinar is just one example of the fantastic opportunities that Agios has developed. Um, I'm guessing that many of you have not had the chance to meet other patients with PK deficiency. So the breakout rooms that we'll be starting shortly are a really great way to connect. Um, your patient support manager will continue to share different opportunities and events as they're developed. Living with a rare disease can be really isolating for many patients. Um, and when you have that chance to connect through your experience and learn from each other, it can be so rewarding. Um, although PK deficiency is a rare disease, it's not rare to us and we're here to support you and help you through your journey. You can go to the next slide. 
Um, I just wanted to introduce the two patient support managers. Um, when you enroll into my Agios, you'll be contacted by Nafar or myself. Um, if you were to call this phone number at the bottom of the screen or email patient support at agios.com, we're always at the other end of that communication. Um, we're both nurses experienced with rare diseases and insurance navigation. Um, personally, I've been a nurse for over 15 years. I've supported patients with rare blood diseases as a nurse case manager, providing both rare disease education um, and reimbursement and access support. Um, I do live in Connecticut with, with my husband. I have four very busy kids and a lot of animals. We like to spend a lot of time outside. Um, but my ultimate goal is to empower people with PK deficiency and their caregivers to become their own best healthcare advocates. Um, an education patient or caregiver has the tools to have meaningful conversations with their healthcare team and collaborate to create a plan that maximizes their quality of life. So I just wanted to go through quickly the steps to enroll into my Agios. But again, if you have questions after the webinar, then you can always just call and we can walk you through it again. So I'll pull this here and here. I hope you can see the, the website. Someone can give me a thumbs up. You can see the no PK deficiency website. You can, okay. Um, yep, I'm hoping that, that everyone is familiar with this website. If you're not, it's a really great tool and there's a lot of great information on there. Um, and you can go over to the helpful tools section, click on my Agios, and then you'll scroll, scroll down to the bottom and you can go to the go now. So you can also go directly to that website also. Um, and then this is the enrollment form. So there's just some basic information there. The, the information is also highlighted in red at the bottom. Um, and once we have that, that completed form, we'll, we'll give you a call within 24 to 48 hours. We'll go back to the presentation slides. And the next slide here, we'll just um, has a couple of the frequently asked questions that we've received over the past couple months. Um, but if you do have additional questions after this, um, I think there is another quick question and answer section, or you can just put it in the chat. Um, so the first question is, how much does my Agios cost? There is absolutely no fee associated with this program. It's complimentary and offered by Agios. Where is my data stored and how is it used? Um, patient information is stored in a private secure documentation system that Nafar and I use. Um, our privacy policy is right there if anyone was interested in it. And we use the patient data to help us just to provide the support services that meets your needs. Um, we kind of went over this next question a little bit, but is this program just for patients who are newly diagnosed? Um, and the answer is no, this program is really designed for people at any different stage of their journey with PK deficiency. Um, so if you've been recently diagnosed, you know, we may cover more disease education, um, but you may also have had, it, had PK deficiency for a long time and maybe you're going to college or moving or traveling. Um, and th those are different changes that we can help with also. Uh, finally, the last question there, can I call with questions before moving? So yes, of course you can. Um, there's our hours there and our main phone number. And Nafar and I are, are available to answer any questions or concerns. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can just send those in the chat um, and we can, we can send those along or share those with Liz. Um, so feel free to keep those coming in, but we're just gonna keep moving along here. Um, before we provide you with the opportunity that we talked about earlier to break off into smaller groups um, and to connect with other attendees, we have five brief survey questions that we would really appreciate you answering. Our goal is to provide programs that are meaningful and we use this information to help form future webinars. So we would greatly appreciate it if you could take the next minute um, and share your feedback. Please note that all responses recorded are anonymous. There are uh, five questions here, and I'm just gonna give you a moment to complete these. So 
Great. Thanks so much. We'll just leave this up here for another 20 seconds or so. Well, you're while you're all finishing up with the polling questions, I'm going to uh, to talk a little bit about what we're doing next with the breakout rooms. So as I mentioned, we want to provide you all with the opportunity um, to get to smaller groups and connect with attendees. I think one thing we've heard here um, is that that's difficult with a rare condition. You don't oftentimes meet others um, with with the same condition and, and that is that they're going through what you've been going through. So we're excited for you to be able to come together, have your cameras on and your audio um, on as well. Each breakout room will also include a member of the PX group who will moderate the session. Uh, please note that these are not recorded um, and there will not be um, anyone from Agios in these rooms either. We will keep the room open for about 20 minutes and we encourage you to use this time to get to know others and discuss topics that are of mutual interest. There are, however, um, a few basic guidelines that we do need to that do need to be followed. So we ask first that you do not talk about any specific treatments that you may currently be on or that you've been on in the past. We also ask that you do not mention your specific healthcare professional by name nor his or her institution. But we do encourage you to uh, discuss topics that were brought up in today's presentations. So while I know we are all looking forward. Um, to the time when we can also we can host these meetings live and in person again we know that for now these meetings need to remain virtual and as such we hope these breakout sessions will provide you with the opportunity to connect with others uh, in the pk deficiency community so with that um, your screen is going to go blank for for just a few seconds and then you will come out the other side where you will be able as i said to unmute yourselves to turn your cameras on and you'll be in there with um, with others that are on the line tonight. After about 20 minutes, we'll bring you back just for some final words of thanks, and uh, we'll close the uh, the webinar. So give it just a second, a couple seconds, and you will be in that breakout room. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that session. Um, and if you enjoyed uh, this evening's webinar and you would like to see other webinars being offered by Agios, you can visit nopkdeficiency.com backslash patient-programs and you'll see the lineup there. Um, we've got programs planned um, almost every month throughout the rest of this year. So for more and for more recess, resources about PK deficiency, um, please do visit Agios' website, nopkdeficiency.com. Thank you all for taking the time this evening, and I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Dr. Sheth and Jill and Liz for uh, their presentations this evening um, and for sharing uh, their experiences. So we we're thankful for all of you for taking the time today to join us and to share your knowledge. And thanks again to all of you for attending, and we hope to see you at a future program soon. Thanks very much and have a great evening.